All right, uh, so I want to talk to you guys about uh, work I've been doing from PhD, um, basically looking at dwarf galaxies and uh, why they're really interesting and really fun to simulate. Uh, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, so I'm going to talk about, just sort of give you guys a little bit introduction of why dwarf galaxies are really useful as star formation laboratories. So first, we all know uh, back in the 70s, uh, 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 studies like Sterling Zinn were talking about present day dwarf galaxies, um, they're the fossils of hierarchical growth in galaxies. We take the small things, they collapse, we throw them together, we make the big things. So if we can study what they looked like, we know what they look like now, we'd like to look, like, look at what they look like early on. However, that's at very early times in the universe. And so a nice easy way to do this is to simulate them with uh, simulations, computers. Um, now the really cool thing about dwarf galaxies is that it's very easy, or it's easier, to do high resolution simulations of the size scales that you want to be important to star formation. Star formation happens on a very local, small scale, but in dwarf galaxies, they can really influence the large scale properties of the dwarf galaxy. And maybe we can learn something about what star formation means in the even bigger galaxies. And so what a lot of people have been uh, finding over the past few years is that feedback in star formation can dramatically redistribute mass within these dwarf galaxies. You can do a lot of fun, interesting things, such as, oh, I went too fast, went too fast. All right, uh, so they can drive huge variations in the galactic potential in these dwarf galaxies. Uh, you can turn a uh, cusp into a core. Darn it, James. I do this all the time. Uh, so simulations by Sergio Mischenko, uh, Fabio Governato, uh, Justin Reed has done some simulations early on. Uh, Romain Tessier have seen that if you do a lot of this uh, stuff, you can turn a cusp into a core. Um, now, where I got into the game is I thought, you know, dark matter is a collisionless uh, particle. It's a collisionless fluid. Well, what else is collisionless? Stars. And so I thought, what does this do to the stars? And so we went and we looked through some simulations, and we found that star clusters act just like the dark matter. They form in the very center. The stars form in the very center, where it's very nice and dense. And they float out to fill the center of these dwarf galaxies. Now, this is Fornax. This is a nice slide that I always make. I love to show it. I show it in every talk I give on my uh, thesis. And the idea is Fornax is a dwarf galaxy in the local group. Okay, this is a size scale. Um, Fornax has globular clusters. There are a lot of dwarf galaxies that have globular clusters and a lot of interesting questions that you can ask about how these globular clusters formed. This is just a zoom in. And here is my simulation. You can see that we're actually forming things on the same size scale that we see uh, in the local group. And those very, very white dots are actually dense clusters of stars. Now, this is just a simulation, a movie, that shows that what I say that it's dynamic, it really is. The yellow particles are stars, the green is gas. And you can see that stars form in the center and get thrown out. And they continuously get sloshed around and it's very, very, very energetic, very violent, and you can do a lot of really interesting science with these types of simulations. So, I talked about stars and star clusters. I want to talk about something else that I've been working on that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. And it has to do with something that maybe some people in the audience are not too familiar with, so I'll try and give a little bit of an overview and that is globular clusters. Specifically, the abundances in globular clusters. So this is uh, an HST uh, CMD color magnitude diagram of NGC 2808 from Piotr et al. 2007. And you know, we all have this idea of globular clusters are these nice, simple stellar populations, right? We take our little codes, we get our isochrones, we fit them. And it turns out that if you look really, really closely, it's not so pretty. You start getting these multiple main sequences. Okay. Globular cluster that should have the same age, so it should have the same stuff, the same abundances in it, 
But now they have multiple main sequences. And the easiest way, I'm not saying it's the only way, I'm not an expert in this field, but the easiest way to do this is to say, well, I'm going to take a whole bunch of different helium enrichments, throw them together, and I can shift my isochrone over. Okay? And so I can get bluer and bluer and bluer just by changing the amount of helium I have in the globular cluster, in the stars. Now, we also see this in spectroscopy. There's a lot of studies that show that you can get um, different anticorrelations. So a well-known one is the sodium-oxygen anticorrelation. You get this nice little curve. And people have shown that this goes all the way down to the main sequence. This is an intrinsic property of the globular cluster. However, when you look at iron, which is what we think is, you know, the heavy elements, you know, the type 1 supernova, there's no spread. Okay, so they all have the same iron enrichment, but they all have different enrichments in the light elements. So the take home message here is that globular clusters are not simple stellar populations. They're not that simple thing that we really, really, really trust. And so a lot of people have done work in this and trying to figure out what this is. And the purpose of my talk, or the rest of it, is to sort of give an idea of how we can do this with these simulations and the kind of fun science we can do um, and the ways we can go with it. So like I said, globular clusters show evidence of multiple star formation episodes. Um, we have multiple main sequences that show different levels of light element enrichment. And a lot of people think that the most plausible source of this enrichment are asymptotic giant branch stars. Okay, they do a lot of light element nucleosynthesis. You can turn oxygen uh, into sodium through a bunch of different channels. And so how do we get the enrichment? Well, for a long time, first thing that people tried to do is the most naive thing to do is just see how can I change my IMF? And so they'll tweak it, and they'll make it flatter, and they'll make it sharper, because you need a lot of AGB stars within a globular cluster to get the amount of enrichment. But some people don't like to change the IMF. Okay, some people like to think it's universal. Some people like to change it. So people said, well, what else could I do? And there's a second not so easy thing to do, and that's to just make our globular clusters way more massive. Okay, a typical globular cluster is about 10 to the 6 solar masses. That's a number we like to all write down. We quote off the top of our heads. But to get the amount of enrichment that you need, you need a star cluster that's on order of 10 to the 7 solar masses. Now there's a caveat here. You need that 10 to the 7 solar masses if you think of a globular cluster as something that forms in total isolation, in a gas cloud that's homogeneous, away from everything else. And then we take that enrichment, we keep it in the globular cluster, we form a second population of stars because AGB winds are not so energetic, they can't leave the, uh, dwarf uh, the globular cluster. But then what we do, or at least what the simulators do, or the, the theorists that propose this uh, solution, is they throw away the stars. They say, well, you know, I can do a bunch of different tweaks and write down a different uh, arguments that could say, well, I can remove that huge mass of stars. But I don't, I want to think of something easier, something that's more simple. And I've termed this the globular cluster dine and dash. Uh, I think it's a funny title. Uh, and the idea is, is that you don't have to have huge globular clusters that lose 90% of their mass in order to match observations. All you really need to do is form globular clusters in dynamic environments, specifically dwarf galaxies that are experiencing a lot of star formation, a lot of bursty star formation. What happens is these globular clusters actually make multiple passages through the center of the dwarf galaxy where most of the star formation is taking place. They form near the center. Star formation creates feedback that pumps energy into orbits. Now, supernovae are very energetic. They can clear out gas within the few hundred inner parsecs of the dwarf galaxy. This is important because that means we have no iron enrichment. Now, AGB winds, AGB winds stay within the dwarf galaxy. Okay? They don't have as much energy. They can stay. And as the globular clusters pass through the center, they can accrete material. 
Okay, and we're going to use a simple estimate of the accretion. And then eventually, fresh supernova, uh, supernova ejecta fall back into the center because it doesn't get, two minutes, okay, cool, cool, cool. It doesn't get ejected right out of the dwarf galaxy. It comes back. Some of it leaves, some of it comes back. So what I did was I went and I found a simulation that made a cusp, a core, sorry. And that was the Mischenko et al. 2008 simulation. Uh, just some background for those of you simulators who are might, probably going to ask me later on anyways. It was designed to look at the cusp core problem. High resolution cosmological simulation of a dwarf galaxy. Very high spatial and mass resolution. And we found four long lived dense clusters on the order of 200 million years. Okay. So the first thing that we did was we looked a little back of the envelope approach. We said how much AGB ejecta could I get? And the black line is the amount of AGB mass and stars that I have in the simulation at any given time over a function of 200 million years in the simulation. Okay. And if I just use a simple uh, mass ejection or wind loss rate from these AGB stars, I get this gray locus. Okay? And the width of the gray locus depends on uh, different how I estimate things. Now the really cool thing, the encouraging thing, is that I only need about almost a little under 2 by 10 to the 5 solar masses in AGB ejecta to make a 2 by 10 to the 6 solar mass globular cluster have the amount of enrichment that we see. Okay, so that's the, the first step is can this work? I have the, uh, uh, enough ejecta. The second thing I do is I say, okay, what's the simplest thing I can do to estimate accretion? And we can use Bondi Hoyle. Uh, people have been doing it uh, for years and years and years, ever since Bondi and Hoyle wrote down the first sort of estimates. Um, recently, Conroy and Spurgle uh, did a test and showed that you can apply it to globular clusters. So I'm just going to take that. Okay. And so this is basically the money plot. Okay. Well, this is the second money plot. I have like 30 seconds, don't worry. Um, the black line is my accretion for a 2 by 10 to the 6 solar mass globular cluster. Initially, 2 by 10 to the 6 solar mass. And you can see that it experiences huge bursts of accretion. And these huge bursts of accretion are correlated with when the globular cluster passes right through or near the center of the dwarf galaxy. Okay, so it picks up a lot of mass. And that mass can easily double it, the globular cluster's mass. Okay, so if I start off with a 2 by 10 to the 6 solar mass globular cluster, I can double that mass within about 200 million years. Okay, but as I go lower and lower and lower down on the mass scale, I don't double as much mass. Okay, in fact, I get very little accretion, which is cool because observationally, people argue that it's mass dependent. The more massive you are, the more likely you are, or the more enrichment that you see. Okay, so that's it. It's nice and simple, it's quick. I went a little bit longer, I apologize. But basically, my whole point is um, I'm not trying to focus on the simulation aspect itself. Okay, I'm not here to say, oh, my code is better than their code is better than their code. All I'm starting with is, let's say I can form cusps. Cores, I'm never gonna get that. Cores and dwarf galaxies, what can they do? And uh, they can do a lot of cool stuff, so thank you very much.